All right, so welcome back. We are now in uh, part four of chapter nine in cell signaling. This will be the last lecture for chapter nine. Uh, lecture five will be on chapter 10, part uh, 10.2. So we will finish this up pretty quickly and uh, then we'll move on. So signal transduction via calcium ions. Um, I wanted to keep this a little bit separate simply because we're, uh, there's a lot going on with calcium ions when we start looking at the um, intracellular signaling, the ER lumen, and some of the effects that are, that are occurring. And this is because calcium uh, ion concentrations are used to really to elicit some pretty strong um, uh, cellular responses. Uh, most cells maintain a very large calcium ion gradient and this is maintained by two different types of pumps. We first have the calcium ion ATPase pump. This is a form of transport known as active transport. Uh, we will discuss active and forms of active and passive transport in the cell membrane lecture. But for right now, uh, just as a, a quick reminder, uh, remember active transport is when we are moving molecules against a concentration gradient. So we will be moving calcium ions through active transport from an area of low concentration to an area of high concentration. In order to move a molecule or a, um, a something against its concentration gradient, that's going to require some energy. So this is why it's called active transport. Uh, and then we have the sodium uh, uh, calcium pump or the hydrogen calcium pump. And both of these are what are known as passive transport. And in passive transport, our calcium ion, ions will be moving along their gradient. So they will be moving from high concentration to low concentration. So we're going to pump a bunch of ions to build up a really strong concentration. And then we're going to dump those ions, uh, roll them down a hill real quick, down their concentration gradient to cause some type of electrical exchange across a membrane. So when calcium ions channels open. When these calcium channels open up, calcium ions act as a second messenger. And these second messengers, they're used by plants for, uh, we saw in phototropism, they're used for the opening and closing of stomata when they want to carry out gas exchange, releasing oxygen and taking in CO2. Uh, they're also used to cause cellular changes in a process known as gravitropism. Uh, in gravitropism in plants, uh, this particular characteristic of plants is how plants always know to grow upwards towards the sun. Think about it. When you plant a seed in the ground, you cover it with dirt and it's in total darkness. So that seed has to respond to some type of gravitational pull on the soil itself, on the earth, in order for that cell to know it has to grow upwards so that the stalk and leaves will eventually pop up out of the soil and the plant can receive sun so it can carry out photosynthesis. Uh, animal cells use calcium ion gradients for muscle contraction, uh, the ability to digest food and produce different enzymes for food, food breakdown and metabolism. Um, it's also used in a lot of nerve transmission. So epinephrine, epinephrine is a hormone signal, um, and epinephrine is one of these uh, one of these hormones that has multiple effects in different parts of the body. So take a look over on the right. Um, if epinephrine were released into this woman's bloodstream, her pupils are going to dilate. That's due to some type of cell signal. Um, she's going to reduce her saliva production. So sometimes when epinephrine is pumping, your mouth gets real dry. Uh, it's going to increase the release of glucose from the liver. It's going to flood the bloodstream with liver. The more epinephrine, the more glucose gets released into the bloodstream. And that is because glucose is broken down for energy. Um, epinephrine is usually released in a fight or flight syndrome. Uh, we also will see constriction of blood vessels. So uh, uh, arterial and venous blood vessels will begin to constrict and tighten up. This is to increase blood pressure uh, to get the blood going where it needs to go with greater pressure. The airways themselves will respond to epinephrine by relaxing. This allows for you to, for you to take a much deeper uh, and larger breath at once. 
the heart rate is going to increase. Uh, heart muscle cells respond by increasing their beat rate and their intensity. And that heart rate increases to try and get oxygen and of course all that extra glucose to different parts of the cell. Now all of this cellular function results in a lot of heat. So we start sweating um, and that is how our body cools itself off. Whenever you have this many chemical reactions and all of these things all going on at once, that's going to cause a lot of heat to form. And uh, the forming of all that heat will cause us also to start sweating so we stay cool. So we're going to talk a little bit about heart muscle cells and uh, cardiac cells are controlled. The contraction is controlled and regulated by calcium ions. And um, I had mentioned it earlier in a previous lecture, but we'll go into more detail here. Calcium ions are stored in a specialized part of the smooth endoplasmic reticulum found in muscle cells referred to as the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And this particular area stores lots and lots of calcium ions. It has a very high concentration of these ions. Now these calcium ions will bind to a molecule called troponin. And when they bind to troponin, this will ultimately lead to muscle contraction. As the calcium ion uh, concentration decreases, the muscle is going to relax. And when the muscle relaxes, a molecule called phospholambin is released and causes the calcium ion pump to get activated. This in turn is going to start pumping those calcium ions back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. All of this is going to be signaled by epinephrine. So here we have our um, epinephrine acting on the heart right, on, on how it increases heart rate and muscle contraction of cardiac muscle. So here is our calcium ion pump, and in this dark pink here, this is the sarcoplasmic reticulum. We have these blue rings. These are the um, ligand-gated uh, calcium channels. So when we pump calcium into the sarcoplasmic reticulum, this um, requires active transport. So this, these calcium ions build up inside of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. When they reach a high enough concentration, they flood out of the sarcoplasmic reticulum and they interact with these uh, troponin, uh, uh, troponin proteins here on actin filaments. When they react with these troponins, it causes contraction. So these actin filaments tighten up. When they tighten up, it causes that, um, uh, uh, that, that calcium ion to be released. And when it gets released, this uh, calcium pump here is gonna pump it back into, sorry, it's gonna pump it back into this sarcoplasmic reticulum. And the whole process is gonna start all over again. So the effects of epinephrine are all of these calci calcium ions flooding out into the heart really fast and binding to these, these troponin proteins on the actual um, actin fibers and on these actin fibers. And when they do that, it causes the fibers to tense up. So these fibers will tense up and we get a contraction. And then as it relaxes, you can see here's phospholambin. Phospholambin binds to this pump, activates it and starts pumping the ions back in. These ions uh, bind uh, out here and they flood, they get a high enough concentration, they'll flood through these ion channels, come out to the troponin, bind to the troponin, activate the phospholambin, the muscle relaxes. And this just process just repeats over and over and over. So that brings us to the concept of apoptosis. Now we've talked about how, how all of these cells signal each other, but there's one process that cells use that's really very interesting, and that's the process of apoptosis. Our cells are really good at knowing when they are done, when they're done carrying out their purpose, or if they are mutated or something is not functioning properly. They're very aware um, individually of their, their functions. And if something is not working properly, they are going to turn themselves off and they commit cell suicide. Now, this type of cell suicide is known as apoptosis because it's programmed. It is something that is programmed into our DNA of our cells and the cells carry this process out very carefully. So it's a form of self-destruction. 
and it can be signaled to a cell either intrinsically or extrinsically. So if a cell recognizes that it is no longer functioning properly, its mitochondria will receive um, protein signals. It will receive, um, I'm sorry, proteins on its surface will start to receive signals from the cell itself. When the mitochondria receives these apoptotic signals, they will start releasing proteins that begin breaking down the cell. And they basically run around the cell and start turning things off. Other times the cell may receive a signal from the outside world. And if they receive a signal from the outside world, say from a um, immune cell because they're virus infected, then the receptors on the cell surface receive some kind of external signal, usually a uh, uh, autocrine or a, a paracrine signaling. Actually, it's um, uh, contact dependent. They'll receive some type of contact dependent signaling from a uh, natural killer cell or a T cell, a cytotoxic T cell, telling them that they have to die. So they're receiving an external signal causing them to enter into this apoptosis pathway. So in the extrinsic pathway, um, the external signal received is um, received by a set of receptors that are referred to as death receptors. The only time they, when they, whenever these signals, they're called fast receptors. Whenever a fast receptor receives a signal, the cell is going to die. Um, the ligand is a three subunit, usually protein, and it's produced by our immune cells. Now, most extrinsic signals and the reason that cells receive the extrinsic signal for apoptosis is usually because they are infected by something. Um, also, another reason would be for some kind of mutation that's occurring. Now the inside or intracellular domain of the death receptor um, is called the death domain and it binds to a secondary protein uh, called the FADD or um, uh, FAD protein. That protein binds to a very important enzyme called procaspase. And procaspase, along with the FAST receptor, along with the FADD protein or FAD protein, the three of them together form a complex. The complex is called a disc, and the disc is known as a death-inducing signal complex. Disc is going to run around the cell, and it's going to turn everything off. Now, procaspase as an enzyme is interesting. It's not act it will not become active because procaspase, let me back up here. Procaspase is responsible for initiating this whole death cascade inside of the cell. So once procaspase gets activated, there's no turning back. So this enzyme will not be activated until it is in the final throes of developing that disc complex. Once it's in a disc complex, it is now in such a formation or in such a morphology or shape that it, it starts to get cleaved or broken by proteases. Um, the cleaved procaspase now acts as um, a protein called caspase and caspase runs around and shuts everything off. So an active caspase protein will be released from the disc complex from that death-inducing signaling complex and will start activating other proteins called executioners. And these executioners, everybody just runs around the cell and starts breaking things down and digesting things and um, just destroying the cell um, all at once. So again, it's this signaling cascade. So we have our, our fast receptor gets bound um, when it gets activated, a FAD will bind to it and a um, procaspase will bind to it. This causes procaspase to get cut. And when pro, pro Procaspase gets cut, caspase itself is released, caspase will run around and start activating other proteins um, called executioners, and the executioners run around and destroy everything in the cell. Um, I, this video is not working um, here in my PowerPoint during a recording, so I will upload it, but this is Tarceva. It's a drug used um, that was in research several years ago for um, I think it's activity against liver cancer uh, and pancreatic cancer. And it talks about a set of RTK pathways called HER receptors, H-E-R receptors. And HER receptors are also involved in breast cancer, just so you know. Um, but it's a really good video that really highlights the entire pathway um, of the EGFR pathway in particular. And so Tarceva as a drug 
targets the EGFR, her receptors, to prevent them from activating that receptor tyrosine kinase cascade. So I will find it on YouTube somewhere and I will upload it into the Unit 2 folder. I have a, uh, um, I have a little folder in there already with one on RTKs, so I will upload a few more videos in there. But this one is, is really good, so I will find it for you. So that brings us to chapter 10, section 10.2. Out of this entire chapter, we're only covering section 10.2, referring to cell junctions. Um, in multi multicellular organisms, cells have are oftentimes in contact and lots of cells together are gonna form something like an organ. Um, say a kidney or a liver. So they have to have contact and within that contact they must have some kind of structure. So the structure that occurs between cells aside from an extracellular matrix are cell junctions and they are very specialized mainly for support, for anchoring, and of course for cellular communication. Now we have different types of junctions in different cell types. So um, Eukaryotic cells are the only multicellular organisms, so we have animal cells and plant cells. And in the animal cells, we have uh, anchoring junctions. There are four different types of anchoring junctions. We have tight junctions and gap junctions. In plant cells, there are two types called, one is the middle lamella, which is used mostly for um, anchoring, and the plasmodesmata, which is used primarily for signaling and sharing of nutrients. So let's look at animal cell junctions. The four primary categories are um, uh, based on or divided between whether or not the proteins used are cadherins or integrins. Um, these are called cell adhesion molecules or CAMs. And the CAMs are used to anchor to each other or to the extracellular matrix. So cadherins and integrins are the two um, uh, uh, proteins that are used. So let's take a look at the categories of, of um, cell junctions here. We have adherins. Adherins connect cells to each other using cadherins. Um, and the cadherins form these kind of bands around a cell, like these protein belts, and just kind of tie them all together. Desmosomes connect cells to each other with little rivet-like spots called cadherin spots. So adherins and desmo desmosomes are made out of cadherin proteins. Focal adhesions are um, connecting cells through to the extracellular matrix, and they do this with um, integrin proteins bound to actin filaments found in the extracellular matrix. So focal adhesions keep cells where they're supposed to be in the whole body. Hemidesmosomes are also made out of integrins, and they connect cells to the extracellular matrix to intermediate filaments. So focal adhesions bind to actin filaments and hemidesmosomes are integrins that bind to intermediate filaments. So let's take a look at what this looks like. So here we have our adherins junctions, right? So here's our two cells that are anchored together, right? Made out of these cadherin proteins. Here are desmosomes. Desmosomes are these rivet-like structures and these rivet-like structures are kind of bound together. These are also some uh, uh, cadherin proteins. Now here are, in, in green here, these are intermediate filaments, and you can see that we've got some uh, cadherin proteins that are binding to that. Integrins would bind to that, and here's an integrin protein, green, right? You see the green? There's the integrin, uh, and a hemidesmosome, and here we have a focal adhesion. So here they're just trying to show you a little closer up here are the actin filaments and here is the plasma membrane and we of course have um, these cadherins that are bound together like this. And then over here we have um, our linker protein. All right, and so here we have a uh, intermediate filament and of course an actin filament here. And that's the integrin protein that's spanning across the two. Other animal cell junctions include the tight junctions and gap junctions. Tight junctions form a really tight seal between two adjacent cells. This is used to prevent the leakage of any kind of extracellular fluid um, anywhere it's not supposed to be. And ex uh, the perfect example of tight junctions are intestinal lining. We bring food and water and all kinds of different things into our intestines and the cells that line 
our intestines have to have really tight junctions to prevent anything from moving between those cells that's not supposed to. Gap junctions occur when two cells that are adjacent to each other form some type of protein channel between them. Think of like a little straw or tube that's um, formed between them and this allows them to exchange and share some nutrients. The channel itself that occurs is referred to as a connexin. So here we have some examples of our uh, tight junctions and gap junctions. So here's a tight junction. The lumen here, they're referring to the, um, the inner portion of your gastrointestinal tract. And then here, of course, is the extracellular fluid. And we don't want any of this fluid leaking out into the lumen, just as we don't want any bacteria or anything in the lumen moving here into um, the, uh, the gut. So here's the same thing. Here's another tight junction. You can see how tight. This is the side of the cell that's facing, right? This is the gut right here, the inside of the intestines and this really super tight junction. Notice it doesn't go all the way down between the cells, but it's really just kind of this first portion here, almost like cement, uh, so nothing can leak through there. Here we have um, some more, here's a uh, connexin protein forming that pore in between in a gap junction, uh, in between two cells, so these cells can share some small, small molecules and nutrients. Plant cell junctions, are there's just two of them, plasma desmata and middle lamella. The plasma desmata is analogous to the um, gap junction in animal cells. It's a small passageway or some kind of hole or tube in between two adjacent cells. Uh, however, in plants, it's not composed of protein. It's just simply a hole in between the two cell walls. The middle lamella actually is like a gel kind of concrete that's going to um, stick cells together very tightly. So here on the left, we have the middle lamella. Um, remember, plant cells are kind of ovally, not, they're not really square or perfectly round. So there's this space that occurs between them. You can see it right here in the drawing and then up here in this electron micrograph. So we see we've got this um, space in here and the middle lamella is just really a gel-like substance used to help concrete or attach these cells and fill in these uh, gaps. Here we have a, um, we have a plas plasmodesmata occurring between these two adjacent plant cells. So here's the middle lamella in the blue line. We have our two plant cells uh, that are on, one on either side of that line, sorry, one on either side of that line. And then we have this kind of, what's called a desmotubule. It's part of the endoplasmic reticulum and it forms a tube in between, sorry, in between the ER of both cells. So we don't really have a protein channel so much as we just have uh, this formation, the cell wall even kind of forms this tube in between two adjacent cells so these cells can uh, share, share nutrients, uh, share proteins, uh, share resources. So that's all we have for section 10.2. It's just the different cell junctions, what they're used for and what they're composed of. Um, and uh, that is it for chapter nine and for chapter 10, section 10.2. So we were able to do this, it looks like in a four part lecture series. Uh, I will uh, start working on cell membrane. We'll get that up for you. And uh, don't forget to work on your, um, on your, uh, cell communication project, you definitely want to get your communication pathways selected as soon as possible so we can go over that in class.